As always, I try to explain how I end up with the material that I'm going to use today. What process did I go through? Um, and it's a, a mysterious thing how the Spirit leads and guides me. And I think you've been watching this channel and those who come by our class understand. It's hard to really put your mind around unless you're really tuned into what the Spirit is doing. Um, my habit, as my dear wife knows, every morning when I get up is to get a cup of coffee. And I have a, a Bible uh, down on my reading table over there that's broken into readings for each day. It's got um, Old Testament reading, of Proverbs, Psalms, and a New Testament reading. And so I spend my morning contemplating and focusing on God's Word as my way of starting the day. I keep a little notebook beside that little study Bible, and when I run across verses or concepts that I think, that's pretty interesting, that's pretty neat, uh, I write it down. And I have gathered <laughs> stacks of little notepads of things that I've run across over um, years now uh, of things that I thought, boy, I wonder if the people of God know that, or I wonder if anybody's ever taught Christians this concept, or I wonder. If... And so um, as I was kind of struggling with what I should teach for this lesson a couple of weeks ago, um, I went to open up my Bible, and underneath the Bible that I have in my study next to the computer is where I put those little stacks of notes with all the little scriptures on them. And I picked up the Bible and that big stack kind of flew up, like kind of a little cloud, like, it's like, hmm, maybe I'm supposed to do something with this. Uh, and sure enough, I was led to take the scriptures that I'd written down and find some hopefully, inter um, not entertaining, but informative scriptures that maybe you've never heard of or thought about. Yeah, I'm sure you've heard of them, but that's where this came from. So what you're going to see today is a Hungarian goulash of scripturism. It's bits and pieces from here and yonder. Um, it's the, or if you're back in the old days when you used to ride the railroads, it's the mulligan stew of the Bible. It's where everybody brought in a little piece and they put it in a pot and they stirred it all together and that's what they ate. Well, I think of here, there, here, little, there, little. Here, little, there, little. That's the, this is the ultimate expression of here, little, there, little. And I hope it's instructive and informative and hopefully enlightening. And But that's my way of explaining how I got to where I went today. And the other piece that's been added to the teaching is the use of artificial intelligence imagery. I have found that I can produce images by asking artificial intelligence programs to create things based on the scriptures that I'm looking at. Some of them are great and some of them are not. But every image, including the thumbnail that, if you watch this online, you'll see the, the first image with the the title in it, everything you'll see today that goes with the spiritual food for thought is created by artificial intelligence. It's supposed to be. Yeah, the original opening thumbnail is one of the cherubim that guard the throne room of God. We talked about Ezekiel lately, and I found the imagery that, to me, the most profoundly accurate image that I could find that seemed to visualize what Ezekiel saw. So if you look at that first image, that's what that is. And the reason I use that image is because it's those creatures guard the throne room of God and you, how seamlessly does this flow into this image, will have to stand before the throne of God yourself one day and give an account of yourself. This image, to me, has truly profound implications to it. I think the vast majority of people don't really sit themselves down as a human being and go, I'm created 
I have to give an account to my Creator. I have to give an account to my Creator alone. It is a individual, primary concern for all rational, spiritually seeking individuals. And yet, I bet you the large majority of even Christians, certainly pagans who live in the world who think that I'm accidentally created and none, I don't have to give an account for anybody or for anything I do. Um, that's not something that comes to most people's thought processes. But to me, that's the image I wanted to show you as we looked at the spiritual food for thought this week. Some key concepts that all Christians should be aware of, and yet, sadly, are seldom taught or explained. In this lesson, I need you to be a Berean. Anybody understand what that expression means? What does it mean to be a Berean? That's right. That's right. To seek it out yourself. You know, yeah, right. That's exactly right. You, do you think as you mentally visualize people sitting next to you in pews in any church anywhere that most people are deeply searching the word for themselves to confirm what it is that they're being taught from the pulpit? Or is it a carte blanche acceptance of whatever somebody says to you as the gospel truth when you yourself do not know whether that is true or not? Because you, as an individual, do not study the word for yourself to confirm these things. It's a high percentage that nobody, everybody just takes it part long. I think you're right. And to me, that is the reason that the body of Christ is in its Laodicean state today. We are surrounded by professing Christians who know little to nothing about the Bible that they claim to believe in. Except maybe the basic structure of salvation, which most churches try and do a fairly good job of presenting. How do you get saved? Okay. But there is so much more beyond that, and the implications of the information that's in the Scripture above and beyond that simplistic milk level is the determination and the impetus by which that you yourself grow. You become strong in the Lord. You have the faith to conquer the mountains of your life. So, now that we understand what a Berean is, I want you to search out the scriptures I'm about to give you for yourself and try to incorporate these spiritual concepts into your spiritual and physical life in a way that will change you. Right now, the people of Israel and Jerusalem are being attacked from on all sides their very existence is being threatened. And at the same time, the world is condemning them for defending themselves from genocide. How do you justify defending, protecting your own existence at the same time where people are condemning you for doing it? That's the world we live in. And yet, what does the Scripture tell us to do? Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you, the holy city. We as believers in this congregation pray for the peace of Jerusalem and the nation of Israel. We know because we have been Bereans 
and understand that Israel will not be destroyed. Jerusalem will be the capital of the millennial reign of Christ on the earth and that the Jewish people will not ever be extinguished from planet earth. That's what the Bible says, and it's been 100% correct since its inception. So the scripture tells us that we are to pray and support. Do we support every action that any government does anywhere? Well, of course we don't. Do we support the actions of our own government, whatever country you live in? Absolutely not. But the scripture doesn't tell us to pray for the peace of Zimbabwe, although we want everybody there to be safe. We are told to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, for the nation of Israel, for the Jewish people, because the Bible is very clear in its indication that the last seven years of human history called the tribulation will be the crucible around which the nation of Israel finally comes to faith in the Messiah. <laughs> It is the crux, it is the axle around everything else that spins for the culmination of humanity is based and centered in the tiny nation of Israel. If you don't know your own Bible and you're confused by these concepts, it's time for you to be a Berean and gather in this truth. Now, before I show you this next image, I have a little background I want to share with you. I told you that I used all artificial intelligence to illustrate these concepts. I asked the artificial intelligence this many times to create an image for me in Jerusalem where there was no Dome of the Rock still there, and that the temple would be placed back on the Temple Mount. It would not draw it or illustrate it for me. I asked it four times to take the dome down, remove it, and in place of it, put the image of the new temple. It refused to... What does that tell you about artificial intelligence? It is very biased. Now, I set the scene for what I'm about to show you. I finally just said, make me an image of a Jewish temple. Are you ready? Look what they include. By the way, I reread the beginning of Ezekiel 40 and 41 yesterday morning and this morning. And it describes the millennial temple and what it will look like. Also, the tribulation temple will be very close in appearance to this. But regardless of whether the, the tribulation temple, when it's built, which will be the Antichrist temple, essentially, and the millennial temple, which will be built after the tribulation, they are square-shaped, okay? It's not, there's no curvy to it. It's very Bob angular. Bob. It's, it's very, there's no curviness to it. Okay, you with me? It's very blocky and, and rectangular in its description of how you build it. Solomon's temple was that way. Herod's temple was that way. The tribulation temple is going to be this way. And the millennial temple is going to be that way. I suggest you read Ezekiel 40 to 48, and it gives you the detail of what the temple is going to look like. This is what AI, after many promptings, drew for me as the temple that will be in Jerusalem. What do you notice about it? Yeah, it looks like a mosque. It kind of looks like something in India. It looks like a combination of everything. That's exactly right. Don't you find that interesting? See, see, that's how it reminds me of um, the, com the, com the com yeah. Oh, Dubai. Dubai. The temp the ho the house of Abraham. Yeah, where they got the three 
uh, the, the mosque, the temple, and the... Well, I mean, you see all three of those structures. It looks like it, there's something from everybody. Is that a beautiful image? <clears throat> I think it's a gorgeous image. But the obvious architectural emphasis is on the dome. It's domes. Uh, yeah, there's five of them. Yeah. And again, if I hadn't set that up for you to curious. explain to you why this turned out to be this way, you would miss the impact of it. As I was writing this section, it I, it hit me over and over again. Artificial intelligence is not unbiased. It is actually very biased, and it is trying to manipulate and deceive you into believing that which is not true. Back to the concept of being a Berean. Delta. There's seven domes on that. that seven? Uh, do, doesn't... Uh, um, Islam, don't they call, they'll have a singer who calls from the prayer. Yeah, I forget the name of that guy. Or, uh, right, yeah. Yeah, they, from a turn, a turn yeah. There's a specific name for the position. Yeah, you're right, oh, there yeah, are. Oh, yeah, yeah, I see that. Well, maybe they're all the way around. Maybe one there. AI clearly doesn't know what a Jewish temple is. No, that's right. But I've, I've met, I've, several times as I... Well, maybe well, it does. When I finish writing these lessons, I go back and I preview all the screens and I think about, should I use that image or just should I try to just change it to something else? But the more it hit me, what was happening was in itself a lesson that I was trying to teach. And I hope I got my point across. Let me ask you, the, the, the window is almost a pentagram. Almost, yeah. It does have that kind yeah, of look to it, doesn't it? I think so. Yeah, I think it's. But it's got that same imagery of the of a pentagram. Anyway, um, so what's my message as far as spiritual food for thought in this particular lesson or this particular scripture? Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Stand with the Jewish people. Okay, moving right along. This is Ezekiel seven nineteen. Anybody want to read that? They will throw their money in the streets, tossing it out like worthless trash. Their silver and gold won't save them on that day of the Lord's anger. Okay, you Bereans, what is the reference on the day of the Lord's anger pointing to? Can you tell me in a time linear sense what is the day of the Lord that's being described here? Tribulation. Certainly all of the tribulation is considered day of the Lord. <laughs> That second coming, the day he puts his foot on the Mount of Olives and splits it in two and starts his reign on the earth is the, the day of the Lord, if you will. All the tribulation is the day of the Lord because it's the opening of the seals and the judgment falls. But when he finally comes back at the end of the seven years and puts his foot on the Mount of Olives and starts the judgment piece, that's the day of the Lord that's being spoken of here. It also is an indication to me of some other very important things that are going on in our society today. You will hear lots of people saying the money that we now have is about to be wiped away in a digital tidal wave, that everything will be digital and nothing will be, you won't have anything like paper money or coins or any of that sort of stuff. It's all going to be zeros and ones. India's already done that. Oh, several countries have. But anyway, it's the whole concept of, okay, if you've got silver and gold, it's going to be good. That may very well be true in the short term, but in the long term, unless you can convert that silver and gold into digital numbers, zeros and ones, it also will be worthless to you during the tribulation. So currently, why did I pick this particular verse? Because many people are still relying on the concept that there is some physical way that you can maintain your wealth and protect it in the global society that's unfolding around us. Is that or is that not a lie? It's a lie. It's part of the deception that we're being fed. And this image I thought was very interesting. People jumping from the roofs and angels ministering. 
the day of the Lord will be very interesting because certainly on that day, you know, your silver and gold is not going to save you. <laughs> yep. Very important concept. Who are we as believers supposed to put our trust in? The blood of Christ. He is our provider. He is our sustainer. He is our protector. He is all that we are supposed to, by faith, put our faith in. Not the riches of the world, not gold, not silver, not anything. Okay, because this is what's coming. And the Bible teaches us so. Does that mean I'm saying you're, there's no reason for you to prepare or be wise in financial matters? Absolutely not. You need to be a Berean in that area as well. But ultimately, the Bible tells us it ain't going to fix it. It ain't going to save you. It ain't going to protect you. Capish. Okay, the next one. This is, um, and I don't know if I even wrote it down, um, and it's kind of small, and, and I'll have to make sure Renita pulls it up and I remember what verse this was because I don't think I put it up here. I think it's Galatians. Um, the Word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword cutting between the soul and the spirit, between the joint and the marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Back to the original screen that I started this with. If you are not a Berean and you don't study the Word of God for yourself, is the Word of God alive and powerful in your life? Is the sword of the Word cutting out the stuff in your life that's not supposed to be there? That's a pretty deep question when you think about it. If you are not a studier of the word, is the sword working in your life is my question. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes, and he is the one to whom we are accountable. Back to that original image that I showed you as we started this lesson. You alone, singularly, will have to stand before your Creator. <coughs> Nothing in your life or about you will be hidden. So then, since we have a great high priest who's entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest is ours, understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings that we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of grace and obtain mercy and help in time of need. It's one of my most favorite verses as far as concepts is concerned. And I found this image and it really kind of struck me. The word of God is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword no, I created it. I had it created. But back to the very first verse, verse 12 here. And again, I'll get the, or Renita will help me find the passage. I can put it up there. You guys can see it. Um, the word of God is alive and powerful. What if you don't ever look into the word of God? What if you're not studying the word of God? What if you're not a Berean of the concepts within the Bible? Is the word doing you any good? It can't work if you don't know it. That's it. I think about in the clubs in our homes, there's a lot of power in the walls. Oh, that's a good, yeah. And if you don't take the plug and plug into that power source, it's completely dead and useless. Boy, that's a great an illustration yeah. there. I like that. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So, What's your take on this bit of spiritual food for thought? Why did I include this in our lesson today? Well, because we need to know the word for it to work for it. That's exactly right. And most people are woefully undereducated in this matter. And what you're actually doing is you're cutting off from yourself the power source necessary to fix the stuff in your own life. 
this I had to put in. I had this little note scribbled to myself in one of that pile of notes that I was telling you about. And I thought, somewhere I'm going to use this. And after reading or looking at the sharper than a two-edged sword, this really jumped off the page at me, and I was told to put this in right now. The most important thought I ever had was that of my individual responsibility to God. You got to stand before your creator. All right, quick pop quiz. Are there, are there more than one judgment seat that when you pass, you have to stand before, depending on who you are? Bema and the great white there it is. Bing, bing, bing. We have a Berean in our study group here. All we are all Bereans, but that's true. If you're a believer, when you die, or if the rapture, which is the very next event that's going to happen in the prophetic event, let it happen today, right now, Lord. When we are raptured out of here and the bodies are changed and the twinkling of an eye and our spirit that's in us now gets a new home. <laughs> And we go to heaven, to the Father's house, which Christ has been preparing a place for us for 2,000 years. That's where we go. Change in the twinkling of an eye, so that as John 14, 1 through 3 says, where I am, you may be also. He's not on earth. We got to go where he is. So when that happens, that change, the next thing that's going to happen to you as a believer, you got to stand at the Bema seat of judgment. That is not like some cartoonist would have you believe. Oh, you get to come in. There's Peter standing at the door, opening Peter. You know, come on in. You you pass the test. If you're in heaven, you pass the test because you believed on the blood of Christ as your salvation. Because that's the only way you're going to the bema seat anyway. When you get to the bema seat, you don't have to justify yourself to the Father anymore. The blood of Christ covers you, and you're already justified. So what is this judgment seat, the Bema seat, for believers? What do you get there? What happens to you there? Rewards. You get rewards. If you're like, you've done good things. This is not earning salvation, folks. This is what you've done because you've been saved. Whatever rewards, by the way, well, everybody gets one crown at least. It's the crown of believing that Christ did what he said he did. Ding! We all get one of those okay. dying. Faith, yeah. And you also get one, and everybody in this room right here, and certainly many of you by way of the internet, if you place your faith in Christ, you are also looking fervently right now for Christ to come back and take us home. Come on, Lord, let's go. Time's up. You get a crown for that. It's called the watching and waiting. Ooh, so everybody gets two. That's good. If you soul win, that's another one. There's, a, there's two other really important ones, and I can't remember off the top of my head, but I can send them to you, if you if, and maybe Renita can put them up. But that's the only reason believers stand, and it's not judgment either. Bema seed is not judgment, it's rewards. Now, if let's say you're somebody who rejected the message of Christ, and you didn't think that the blood of Christ was going to solve your problems, and you're going to work your own salvation out, you're going to be real good, and you're going to get into heaven. Well, you got a surprise coming. When you die, because you ain't going in the rapture, you go to a little holding place called hell in the earth, and you don't come out of there for a thousand years because the great white throne judgment doesn't happen until the end of the millennium. I didn't make this up. It's in Revelation. Um, and then you stand before the great white throne judgment, and you have to give an account of yourself why you didn't believe what the Bible says and that Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And there is no justification for you. You will be sentenced to eternal damnation. The lake of fire. Those are your two destinations. Burning, 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 burning. Yeah. I can't. No. But this screen and the last couple of concepts, I felt, is so important in these last dying seconds of the last days that we have. Okay, this next verse I have for you is Ezekiel 7. This is verses 10 through 12. Anybody want to read that? The day of judgment is here. Your destruction awaits. 
The people's wickedness and pride have blossomed to full flower. Their violence has grown into a rod that will beat them for their wickedness. None of these proud and wicked people will survive. All their wealth and prestige will be swept away. Yes, the time has come. The day is here. I don't care if you're a trillionaire, billionaire, millionaire, your wealth is worthless. Notice some of the key concepts in here. Did anybody catch anything that really struck you as you read through that? Pride. Pride. I, th I thought verse 11, uh, the violence had grown into a rod uh, that will beat them for their wickedness. With a rod of iron, yeah. But this is talking about the end of the tribulation and during the tribulation, where the wickedness will be dealt with. Think about all the um, oligarchs. Yeah, the ten kings that, that have money that are controlling things right now and manipulating things behind the scenes. Oh yeah. And that their day is coming. Their day is coming. Anything else that you got out of that? Well. It is. That, that that's right. That's all interconnected to these scriptures that I ran across. That well, people who are trying to tell you that they you can store up treasures here on the earth um, are <laughs> misleading you and misleading themselves in many ways. Again, I'm not saying don't prepare, don't be concerned about what you can do right now because that's being a good steward of what you have. I mean, that's well, also what the Bible tells us to do. Okay, moving right along. This is. Uh, Hebrews 5, 12 through 14. Again, all this stuff was scriptures that I ran across in my studies, and I wrote little notes down to myself, okay? Thinking, okay, man, I need to share this with my brothers and sisters. Okay, that's where these came from again. Anybody want to read that? You have been believers so long now that you ought to be teaching others. Instead... You need someone to teach you again the basic things about God's Word. You are like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. For someone who lives on milk is still an infant and doesn't know how to do what is right. Solid food is for those who are mature, who through training have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. What'd you grab? What, what struck you when you are in? If you've been in the Word long enough, you should be on meat, not milk. Amen. Are we, are, are we as, I'm going to clump and be, and, be and be teaching others the truth. I'm going to clump all of the believers in the world together in this. As a percentage, what would you guess the vast majority of believing Christians on the earth are? Are they sipping on the pablum or are they got the steak knives out and munching on some prime rib. There, there's, there's still pablum people. Is that? A, I think I just created a new phrase. Pablum people. Pablum people. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, and sadly, back to my um, premise as I started this lesson, we are so woefully unprepared and woefully untaught and, and part of the reason for that and the excuse is upon ourselves because we don't ourselves seek out the things that are solid food. Some of the things that, um, if you are if you don't know what the Bible says, notice this phrase, doesn't know what's right or wrong. That's true, because there's no sword in there hacking the bad part out. And the other thing was, through training. Remember back to, if you don't know what the Word says, if you're not studying the Word, you ain't doing any training. You ain't doing what you need to do to get the sword in you so that the work can be done to prepare you to be a believer like this. When somebody, go ahead. I was just going to say that what comes to my mind when I read this is that babies have to be fed by somebody else. Oh yeah, that's right. And I think about how many in the pews at church are totally dependent on anything and everything that they know. It's coming from the pulpit. That's right. He's feeding them. Right. But when you move on to me, you feed yourself. That's right. Adults, I don't feed him, my husband food. Right. That, that's almost, yeah. He feeds himself. So the way you move is 
means you've got to be willing to stop being fed by some man at the at the pulpit. Get in there and feed yourself. Right. Because he, the man at the pulpit, is just reaching out to maybe those who are not yet even are infants in the faith. That's right. You no. can't just keep relying on him. Right. No, that's right. He may not ever give us the meat because he's reaching out to people who know nothing. That's right. No, and I understand. That's a, and I understand the getting the folks in the boat concept. Don't get me wrong. You got to get them in the boat. But if you're one of these people who is strong in the word because you study all the time and you're sitting somewhere, I don't care if you're watching some channel on YouTube like this one, or you're in a church or you're in a Sunday school class or you're having a Bible study with somebody and somebody says something to you and you know the Bible, you'll automatically go, no, that dog ain't hunting right there. That won't. Yeah, that ain't getting off the porch for me because I can tell you, I know what the word says and that ain't it. <laughs> and you've got to be there. It's what did Christ say the last days the primary theme would be? Deception. Deception. Dece he said it, I think, three or four times in Matthew 24 that there was like over and over again, he kept saying, watch out, don't be deceived, don't look at. You know, don't let this happen. Um, and that's the case. Uh, and that's what's happening around us. We're getting folks who never get past the milk stage. And when somebody tells you something and you don't know any better, you believe it. I think part... That will, that will cause great confusion in some ways. It does. But if everybody was on the same page, i.e. we know what the Bible says, and when somebody tries to tell us something that ain't true, we know it, how much stronger is the body of Christ going to be? A whole lot more. That's right. And that's the point of this particular imagery. What's so sad about that today is that so many churches have become so turned into an entertainment center. Oh, I know, yeah. It's, it's social networking and entertainment, yeah. and they're not sticking to the Word. Yeah, and I'm, and again, I have no desire to put anybody down for preaching the gospel and bringing people into salvation. That's all exactly what teachers and preachers should be doing. But don't leave them on the shore foundering with no food. You got to get them some meat. You got to feed them. And also, just like Renita said, you got to feed yourself. You got to get up off your haunches, get out the crib, and find yourself some walking, talking shoes. Learn the word and be prepared to defend what you know, even if it comes from sources that others are believing. If you catch my. Right, because you can't teach anybody anything if you don't know. Yeah. This is from Ezekiel 14, verses 12 through 14. Then this message came to me from the Lord. Son of man, suppose the people of a country were to sin against me. And I lifted my fist to crush them, cutting off their food supply and sending a famine to destroy both people and animals. Even if Noah and Daniel or Job were there, their righteousness would save no one but themselves, says the Sovereign Lord. Do you understand why I've included this passage in our teaching today? What, what's, the, what's, the, what's the thrust of what, where I'm going with this? What do you think? That it's personal. It doesn't matter if your granny, your grandmother, your great grandmother, your aunt, your uncle, set in the same pew forever. That's right. And they knew it. If you don't, you're still lost. The only person that can save you is the blood of Christ by your confession of that. You, individually. But back to the... Image. I see that image you showed earlier. Yeah. Of a man standing before the throne of God. That's right. My mother taught me very in a very young age she said something that stuck with me forever and it's been probably the most important thing she ever said to me was that it's just between you and god jan because nobody else he knows your heart and nobody else is going to take your place so it's between you and god so when you do something 
you think about whether you stand before the father later on yeah okay the other thing what really struck me about this is look at the first phrase i have in yellow that's underlined suppose the people of a country were to sin against me okay now would you in your analysis of the United States or France or UK or pick a country say that most countries are in open sinful rebellion against God and his commandments in how the governments themselves go about their business of ruling if a nation is contrary to God's word, a nation is contrary Good people in the nation can't save the nation. The policies of the nation have to be godly or God will judge godless nations and governmental structures. That's what I got out of this. So tell me, what should God do to the United States or Great Britain or France or Germany or pick one? Well, the anti-Semitism alone regardless of even all of the other terrible things yeah. that, are, that are happening. But it's some... To get a country right. That's right. But some people, falsely, as you can see here by Ezekiel 14, believe that, oh, if there's just a, you know, if there's kind of like going back to Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, if there's only 10 good people, would you save, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah? There's only 50. But they couldn't even find that. I mean, but that's maybe a bad analogy, but to me, it's pointing to it's you and God. But the nation itself has a responsibility to not be judged by its policies. When a nation's policies are godless and anti-Christ-like, they should expect this. And the good people in the country won't save it. Sorry, that's what the Bible says. Okay, this is, speaking of Hebrews, I, I got stuck in Hebrews there for a while, and you can see why. Hebrews is excellent, by the way. Um, this is very interesting to me, uh, and many times you hear a reference to this. This Melchizedek was king of the city of Salem. You guys understand that before Jerusalem was called Jerusalem, it was called Salem. And then Jeru, Salem. Jeru, Salem. Okay. There was a group of people called Jeru, I forget the tribal group, Jeruasa or, or something like that, and then Salem and Jerusalem. That's where they ended up being that way. But anyway, um, there was a king of the city of Salem before it was called Jerusalem, and also a priest of God's Most High. When Abraham was returning home from winning a great battle against the kings, Melchizedek met him and blessed him. Now, you just have to, speaking of Bereans, put a put a spiritual pause right now and try to go back and read in the um, early scriptures accounts of Abraham and I am struggling to tell you of something that I read in the Old Testament about Abraham fighting anybody. Do you remember? I don't remember, and I read the Bible many, 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 many times, and I don't remember reading where Abraham went out in a battle somewhere. So, this is, Hebrews is given, if I may be wrong, and it's entirely possible, but if I'm right, Hebrews 7 is giving us detail about Abraham's life that we didn't know before, that he was not only the patriarch of the Jewish people, but he went out and fought battles for his people too. Doesn't Jerusalem in the front of Jerusalem mean Jesus? I don't know. I, I, I saw something about that lately, and I can't remember either. Maybe it is. I, I can't remember. But, but Salem means king of peace. King of peace, yeah. Then Abraham took a tenth. Well, for whatever this battle is that he just went and fought, he's coming back to Salem, pre-Jerusalem. And when uh, and Melchizedek comes out to meet him. And, uh, and, and he took a tenth of all he captured in battle and gave it to Melchizedek. The name Melchizedek means king of justice, and the king of Salem means the king of peace. There is no record of his father or mother or any of his ancestors anywhere in the Bible ever. Melchizedek is a mystery. 
There is no beginning or end to his life recorded anywhere. There is no indication of his biblical familiar lineage listed anywhere. He remains a priest forever, resembling the Son of God. This is a prototype and one of those pictures that the Bible gives us of what Christ will be when he rules and reigns on the earth for a thousand years during the millennium. He will be, by the way, it's impossible to be king and priest at the same time. It's not, that's not supposed to happen, okay? Yet Melchizedek was that person who did both roles. Now, I ask AI to give me an image. You ready? Both king and priest. Now, he, they, he, the AI didn't blend them into one person. They gave me two images, okay? But the concept is still valid. Will Christ rule and reign from the earth for a thousand years as king? Yes. Lord of Lord, King of Kings. And, and he will also be the high priest of the temple because he's going to be ruling from the temple. Okay, He's going to be both the governmental structure and the spiritual structure at the same time in one person. God in three persons. He's going to fulfill all those roles. And this is an indication of that that there is coming a time where there will be a theocracy on planet Earth. Not a democracy, which is an abomination of what should be, which is the republic. A theocracy is ruled by one man over everyone, period. And that's what this is going to be in the millennial reign of Christ. He will rule as king and priest, and there will be no... Uh, I'm going to take this to a higher court and see if we can overturn that. Now, whatever he says goes, period. There is no, I'm going to appeal that ruling. No, I created you. You don't get to appeal the ruling. This is the deal. How many of you really ever thought about that concept before? I thought to me, that's kind of one of them Christian things folks should know. You know? This is also from Hebrews. This is Hebrews 10. 19 through 22. Anybody feel? And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new life, giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean. Our bodies have been washed with pure water. Ah, mm. oh, no, guys, that's that's a very comforting. We come boldly the heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Christ. Now, I want you to focus on the phrase "through the curtain" just for a second. Tell me what that means. What's that talking about? The Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies. Where they it, had to tie a rope to the priest in case he hadn't. Confessed his sins and sprinkled the blood over himself. That's right. And been struck dead and pull him out through the curtain. That's right. When Christ was crucified on the cross, when he died and said, it is finished, in the temple, in the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was, it wasn't there, was it, when Christ was sacrificed? Because it was already lost by then. But that's where it was. The curtain that divided the space where the ark was held was split from top to bottom, indicating God has opened the veil so you could come through the curtain and not be killed because of your sinful nature, because we've been covered by the blood of Christ. And we can go boldly into the Holy of Holies right at the foot of God. By the way, the Ark of the Covenant was supposed to be an example of the footstool of God. So when you went in the Holy of Holies, you were literally at the feet of the Father pleading your case. Let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting Him. Our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. I want you to take this image I'm about to show you and apply it to your own life as you go in prayer to the most holy place. This is you in this cape.
you're coming to the throne solely, alone, because of your faith and the blood of Christ has covered you from all unrighteousness. And now you literally can come boldly to the throne of the Father himself and express your needs and concerns. You don't need a mediator, and there's no curtain between you and him. I think an amen goes right there. <clears throat> Do you find that a powerful image and a powerful concept that maybe most Christians don't? Oh, no, I can't go. i got to pray to Saint so-and-so before. No, sorry. I can't. We won't be doing any of that. <laughs> All right, here's the next one. This is also in Hebrew. I got stuck in Hebrews. hope you don't mind. This is 23 through 25. Uh, anybody read that one? Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our living <coughs> together, as some people do, but encourage one another especially now that the day of his returning is drawing near. Can you, see, can you see why I put that in there? What's, what is it about that particular set of scriptures that I think every Christian should be profoundly aware of? Fellowship is important. Don't neglect meeting together like the brothers and sisters that are here today. Get together with folks that have the same belief structure that you do. It's important. Sometimes it's hard to find. Uh, but you need to search out those people as best you can and gather them to you like a chick with some little chicken, you know, under the feathers and, you know, bring them together. And so there's comfort meeting together. You know, I did, yeah, because my lovely chicken tamer over here. I think she's kind of a chicken whisperer. Chicken <laughs> really? nurse. Yeah, it, we need to but it says therefore God can be trusted to keep his promise and that to me also indicates other promises like the promise to Abraham in other words there's he's not going to break his promise I know a lot of people think that there's new covenants now oh, no. God yeah. changed his mind with Israel but nope. he made a promise to Abraham and he can be to, to fulfill it. Out. He's not done with Israel. He's not done with the Jewish people. It's not conditional. No, yeah. And he also, speaking of Abraham, was given the promise, those who bless your people, will bless, you will be blessed. So if we are Gentile of the, the bride of Christ, is what how we should be denoted, if we bless the Jewish people and support them, if, we'll, even, be, we'll, be, we'll be blessed, okay? Yeah, he's coming back to, he's a Jewish priest and king. He, you know, that's it. And we need to be following his people because we've been blessed by being grafted in the wild olive branch so that we have the promises. We got the same promises. And this imagery I found was kind of interesting. The time is close. The time is close. Especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. We got to be ready and be thinking and looking up. Look up for your redemption draweth nigh. When you see all these things begin to happen, as Christ said in Matthew 24, and he's spelling out the conditions that will be in the tribulation when you find the things that are forming in front of you right before the tribulation starts because they got to have all that stuff in place, then you know the rapture is about to happen. So look up. Encourage one another. Uh, don't be down and, oh, doom, despair. No, it's just the time of joy. Generations of people who lived before us would have given their eye teeth to be where we are, when we are, in the time of history that we're in, because we're going to see not the first coming, but the second coming. We're going to see him call us, come up hither, and be looking over the balconies of heaven and see what's happening here. I, I don't know how that's going to work out, but we're that people. We're that generation. It's now. Yeah, the end of the grace is will be over when we're gone. That's right. Although there will be grace given to those who are left behind who turn to Christ. They were the tribulation saints. But anyway, it, interesting imagery, interesting concepts. Again, things that I think all Christians should know. Oh, oh this one got me. I got to. Uh, this is Jeremiah 3, 16 through 17. Okay, um, I'm going to read that. When your land is once more filled with people 
says the Lord, you will no longer wish for the good old days when you possess the ark of the Lord's covenant. I've got to stop right there. Okay. Is Israel filled with the Jewish people again? This is a prophecy fulfilled. Jeremiah said it was going to happen, and it happened in 1948. The good old days when you possess the ark of the Lord's covenant. Do they have the ark? Some say they do. Some say the ark has been found and is in a secret place, ready to be brought out, to be put in the tribulation temple. We'll see on that. Surely with them so prepared for the temple now, they have knowledge of it or had it. Yeah, I, and again, the speculation, of course, is if it's that valuable an object, then I, you would have to say that if the Ark of the Covenant is found and known to be found somewhere, it would have to be the most valuable artifact on planet Earth. I mean, that thing is the pointer of all truth in a lot of ways. If you could verify it and bring it out in the open and show it to people, what kind of profound effect would that have on people around the world? But I don't know whether they even, even if they have it, they'll bring it out. Because remember, the temple that's about to be built is the Antichrist temple. Now, the Jewish people are not going to know that. They're going to think that the guy who gives them the peace treaty, Daniel 9, 27, and that their temple gets to be rebuilt, they're going to think this guy is the Messiah until mid-trib and then there. So I don't know about whether the ark will actually come out or not. But this is the time that's being spoken of, okay, during the, at the end of the tribulation, when all the wrath is over and the Jewish people have bowed the knee and accepted Messiah, um, this is a kind of this reference. You will not miss the days or even remember them. Think about that phrase. And there will be no need to build the Ark of the Covenant again. Okay, are you hanging in there? In that day, Jerusalem will be known as the throne of the Lord. All nations will come there to honor the Lord. They will no longer stubbornly follow their own evil desires. This has to be the millennium. There's no other way you can explain this verse other than this is an explanation of what the Jewish people will be experiencing in the millennium. Okay, now, maybe... Some of you other Bereans out there are a little deeper thought than I have. But I have to... Remember when Noah was saved? He was saved in a what? An ark. And then in the first temple that they had created in the wilderness wandering to get to the promised land, they put the ark of the covenant inside the ark of the covenant or God's promises and his commands. The ark saved them from the, through the water. The ark contained the law. But after that's all gone, there won't be any need for the ark of the covenant. And so, are you ready? I asked AI to illustrate a throne room that incorporated the concepts of an ark that people might go to and stand in front of when Christ is ruling and reigning for a thousand years. <laughs> Are you ready? <laughs> Look at this. That's interesting. Look at the throne room. It's a boat. It's an ark. It's got, it's all kinds the of animals, nautical. Animals yeah, there are animals. There are all kinds of imagery in there. This is not a really clear image. But notice what's in, you know, most churches, they have like little stained glass windows and stuff in the back next to the altar. Baptistry. baptistry. Notice the baptistry here. It's the <laughs> rainbow. It's the promise that the destruction <laughs> is over. The destru I thought, that's pretty interesting, AI, that you would come up with this imagery. Don't you find that neat? I, I just, I, I sat back in my computer desk and went, wow. Anyway, I hope you had that same kind of impact for you. Maybe it didn't. Moving right along, speaking of Jeremiah, 
This is Jeremiah 4. Believe it or not, we're, we're moving sort of along here. I need to speed things up. It'll take here all day. This is Jeremiah 4, 23 through 26. Uh, uh, disclaimer. Da -da 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 -da. i got to give a disclaimer on this one before I even show you this image or talk about this particular scripture. I guess it's time to step on a few spiritual toes. Um, I want you to look at the very first sentence of Jeremiah 4, 23 here. I looked at the earth and it was empty and formless. As a Berean, we are told to take words and phrases that we find in the Bible and apply them to the examples given elsewhere as coloration and additional information to the concepts that's being presented. Where do you remember hearing this phrase? It was empty and formless and void. Genesis 1-2, isn't it? That is the exact wording that Jeremiah 4 was given. I looked at the earth, and it was empty and formless. I looked at the heavens, and there was no light. Does this sound like still Genesis to you? I looked at the mountains and the hills, and they trembled and shook. Okay. Full stop. Genesis 1, 1, 2, and 3 describes the earth as empty, void, and formless, but it is covered in water, isn't it? So just put that, hang that on the shelf behind your head there. Because Jeremiah is seeing an earth that is void, empty, formless, but the water's not there yet. Notice this, because some people will say, oh, this has something to do with, you know, in the last 6,000 years. Okay, well, look. And I looked. All the people were gone. Tell me, has there, and I looked at the earth, because this is talking about the earth. It's talking about some land area here. Has there since Adam's creation ever been a time on planet earth where there were no people at all left on the earth. Yeah. Again, these are scriptures when I run across them and I start to Bereanize them. Is that a word? <laughs> really think about what's being said. This got me, and I've thought about this concept many times before, but I thought, I need to share this with brother, brothers and sisters. All the people were gone. Okay, now that's the, to me, that's really important. All the birds of the sky had flown away. I looked and the fertile fields had become a wilderness and that the towns lay in ruins crushed by the Lord's fierce anger. I don't know about you, but that opens up all kinds of wormy kinds of cans of things. I'm trying to get the formless, but yet it says I looked at the mountains and hills. Yeah, okay. So, okay, you, you got your choice A and you got your choice B. This is literally what Jeremiah saw about the earth at some point in creative history. Or it's all an analogy. What about the end of the millennium when the new heavens, right before the new heavens and earth would be born? People are not all gone. Because people will repopulate the millennium. At the end of the millennium? When it's time for the Well, there's still going to be people that go into the new Jerusalem. So people are not totally wiped out. And that's a good thought. I mean, that's a... You got me. Yeah. Okay, let's hear it. I'm thinking Lost City of Atlantis. I'm thinking all of these strange, under-oceanic, wild-looking structures, structures that have been found. But it's super large. The birds have flown away, so that eliminates the ocean, man. 
Well, right. no, I mean, there, no, but there there could be ocean somewhere else. I mean, but I'm not saying. The ocean's now. Yeah, right. They're finding ruins underneath. That lay in ruins. That, that lay in ruins. And we wonder, who was that civilization? That well. They estimate, oh, it was. Okay, let's go, let's go to South America, Puma Puku. Let's go to Tiwanaku. Uh, let's go to. Um, oh, what? The pyramids, Machu Picchu. I mean, you can go to all kinds, go to the temples of Baal back in Lebanon, the, the pregnant woman's stone, which is a hundred tons cut that were going to be moved by human beings. I, so all these things, this particular. the heavens and there was no life. That's very so interesting they, too. And then he, but he looks at the hills, so how does he see them? I mean, yeah. Kind of okay, yeah. now. You can imagine if you're a teacher of the Bible that you're probably going to avoid this particular uh, chapter and verse because people are going to go, hey, pastor, what's that mean? What's The point being here is there are mysteries in the Bible that I don't think anybody's fully explained and we won't really fully get it until we're on the other side. Changed in the so twinkling of an eye. Yeah, that's right. So this is an indication that there was a rebellion. Okay, that which leads me to the, I'm going to give it to you whether I was trying to avoid giving it to you or not. Remember when Satan was cast down? He was sent to the earth. That was where he was. And maybe, just maybe, there was a civilization of some kind that was on the earth before Adam was created and that God had to judge the corruption of that and in the cities that were destroyed and all the stuff. I, I'm just saying that that makes me think of that because of the archaeological ruins that we find around the world. Yeah, what? We, yeah, all we know is Adam and now, okay? But we don't know what happened before that, and maybe this is an indication of stuff that was going on that we don't know yet. Just saying. And I can look and think of the mountains and the hills and see trees and right. Yeah. But then if I look at the heavens and there's no light and it's empty and formless, I can also envision the mountains and hills that are just there, but that are very bleak. Dead. Nothing Dead. Dead. Nothing is Mars. there. Mars-like. Exactly. Exactly. And then if I'm the one the people are gone and, and, and the birds are gone and the fields, you know, are dried up. Yeah. Well, that, I guess that would be. A, this is the image AI gave me, by the way, when I typed. I, I literally typed the whole. That's not what you're describing. Exactly. Yeah. I, I put this whole verse right. in and I ask it to create an image, and this is what AI gave me. And by the way, if you look closely, there are little cities, little buildings that have been crushed and knocked over back there. And just, things that make you go, hmm, is all I meant by this one. And I, I have to tell you, and I think I told Jan this, I struggle whether or not. Should I put this? Maybe I shouldn't put this one in there. This make people think too hard. Maybe their brain will explode. And then you um, go, oh, why not? Oh, that's right. Because I, I, if I don't do it, who's going to? Right. So moving right along. This is <laughs> Philippians four, four through six. Maybe a little more uplifting uh, as we get closer to the end of this. Okay. Anybody want to read that? Say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. And there it is. Even the AI gave me this image. I thought, that's pretty good, AI. That's not bad. Always be full of joy because we know where our destination is. That's why. This is not bad news, folks. When we see the end of this age coming to pass and we see all the indications that it's about to be rapture time, this is not a time to be sad. We should be joyful beyond a reward. Look up for your reward draweth nigh. This is our hope. This is the blessed hope. This is what, but it also says, remember the Lord's coming and we're waiting or we're watching, but don't worry about anything. Don't worry about it. Pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for what he's done. 
And that's the whole sum of what we need to do as believers on the earth right now. Pray for what you need. Believe him. He's going to take care of you. Because we know where we're going and our future is secure. And an amen goes right there. Okay, Isaiah 35, 8 and 9 again to refresh your memory where this stuff came from. These are verses that I ran across and I thought, hmm, things that most Christians don't know. And a great road will go through the once deserted land. It will be named the highway of holiness. Evil-minded people will never travel on it. It will only be for those who walk in God's ways. Fools will never walk there. Thank goodness. Lions will not lurk along its course, nor any other ferocious beasts. There will be no other dangers. Only the redeemed will walk on it. Those who have been ransomed by the Lord will return, and they will enter Jerusalem singing, crowned with everlasting joy. Sorrow and mourning will disappear, and they will be filled with joy and gladness. A has to be the millennium. That's right. And believe it or not, the highest place on planet Earth, according to the Bible, in the millennium will be Jerusalem. Jerusalem, high and lifted up. And there will be a road that is straight and easy to walk on. And those that have been redeemed I are obviously the bride of Christ. But I think this is more pointedly, imagine if you were a tribulation saint or the remnant of the Jewish people who survived the tribulation, and God has set up his kingdom in Jerusalem and all danger has passed away and you're invited to come to the holy city and rejoice in the presence and the glory of the Lord and the blessings that he's provided for all people left on the earth during that time. It would be a wonderful journey and think about the people you're going to be talking to walking along the road. Look where we're going. Man, but it'll be easy and a path that will be great that we'll, we'll go on. I have created a place called the Highway of Holiness. I thought that was pretty amazing. And a good image, I thought, that AI gave us. This is Galatians 2.16. Yet we know that a person is made right by God by faith in Jesus Christ, not by obeying the law. When you are saved because of the faith that you placed in Christ as your remission of sins, do you then do good things for Christ because you know Bema Seed is coming? Certainly you do. Do you earn your way into salvation because of your good works? No. No, you can't be good enough. There ain't no I'm good enough to get in. That ain't happening. But by the nature of your... By the way, the sword of the Spirit cuts all the garbage out. You start living a different way. You got different things that you want to be motivated to do. You're going to start doing good things. You're going to get rewards at the Bema Seed of Justice. Uh, of rewards, not of justice. And this stuff is so pertinent because you still hear people say, are you going to heaven? I've been pretty good. I hadn't, I know my neighbor has been terrible, but you know, I've been better than him. So I got to go in. No, that's not how it works. That's not what the Bible says. Only by faith in Christ and what he did on the cross for you, believing that saves you not by obeying the law. But you will obey the law later on because your nature has changed because you're studying the Word of God and the Spirit is cutting all that garbage out. That's right. It will be evident. How do you know there's a believer among you? You will know them by their fruit. That's exactly right. And we have believed in Christ Jesus so we might be made right with God because of our faith in Christ. Not because we obeyed the law, for no one will ever be made right with God by obeying the law. Interesting image, don't you think? I would have changed the middle part a little bit. Still, I thought the image was... Oh, that's right. You can do it with a bad attitude, but you can obey. But when you have a relationship with Jesus, it's a whole different attitude. It is. There's a whole different component of love and trust that's so much more powerful than just doing a rope. I'm doing this because it's just what I'm supposed to do. It's a good thing. Yeah. So I want to read that. I'm the one who made the earth and created people to live on it. With my hands, I stretched out the heavens. All the stars are at my command. 
That's a concept you need to get your spiritual self wrapped around. Remember, when you stand before, hopefully at the Bema seat, the person you're standing before created everything that is. Everywhere. The imagery was good. Thank you, AI. That was a pretty good one, I thought. Almost done. How about this image? Remember the things I have done in the past, for I alone am God. And I am God, and there is no one like me. Only I can tell you the future before it even happens. Everything I plan will come to pass, for I do whatever I wish. I have said what I would do, and I will do it. The promises to those of us who are believers are firm and sure. Rest on that. Ephesians 2, 1 through 4, and then we've got one more slide and we're done. Anybody? Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in those hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passion and desire and inclinations of our sinful nature. But our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy and loved us so that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And that's the rest of the story right there. I don't think I really had, I thought this was pretty interesting. Oh, the, the world who living in sin and haven't accepted Christ, obey the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. Um, we're not fighting against flesh and blood. You remember that. If we keep going in Ephesians, you'll get down to Ephesians 6, 12, and it talks about that. War not against flesh and blood, but powers, principalities, rulers of darkness, and spiritual wickedness in high places. That's a pretty good image, I thought, the AI gave me on that one. Look at the, you got a choice. You go this way, or you go that way. or uh, devil, has got a, he's got a plan for you, and all his little minions behind him, but you get to choose. God's rich in mercy, and he loved those who makes the right choice. All right, are we ready? Here we go. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for it. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for good things we have done. None of us can boast about it, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. I don't think I could sum it up any better than that. Any thoughts or concepts that you were presented with today that really struck you that you'd like to reiterate? Can you see why I picked these particular scriptures this week? I think of the cart before the horse. The good things happen after the salvation. That's right. You don't do the good things to get salvation. That's putting the cart before the It is. You do the good things because you've been saved and you now have the proper spiritual impetus to do those good things. It's there in you because the sword's been working. I hope that those who watch this, wherever you may be, please uh, like, share, subscribe, comments, all that kind of good stuff. If it's been beneficial to you, share it with those that you know and love. Put it on your um, social media accounts. Do all that good stuff. Um, we try to do these things because some of the information that the Spirit gives me is not being presented in other ways, in other forms. So again, um, we're not asking for donations. We don't want any of that. We just want to spread the word if you found this to be useful, and please do that for us if you would. Um, otherwise, I, I 
because the time is short. The time is short, yeah. I, I'm going to throw this out here to certainly our class at, at Meets in our home. Um, I have <laughs> at least two more lessons worth of material like this that I could do in the very near future. Is this beneficial to you? Is this process? It's inspirational. I mean, I know some people like you know, pick verse such and such and James and go to verse such and such and teach on that. I mean, that's all good, but what do you think about me continuing to do more of a montage of spiritual food for thought for the next at least couple of lessons? Well, I thought you followed a great thing. It's, it's about individual faith that leads us to your final slide, which is, you know, that we are saved by grace and we can't earn it. That's right. All of that. I felt like you followed a wonderful thing. I have an interesting sure. theory. Uh, you know, we look at ourselves as a realistic, touchable, humanistic person. But it's something that kind of hit me. You know, God created us with a soul that he knew that he could bring that soul back to him one day. So, you know, it's it's kind of interesting to think about all the souls out here. And we were created with, with that particular soul that he can bring back to him one day. Everybody, yeah. You know, if, 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 we, they choose. if they follow the plan that God set forth. So yeah. Anything, Donnie? I mean... Yeah. That no matter how much you study, no matter how much you know, no matter how deep you get, there's always more. Oh, there is. There's always more. And it's kind of like the person that you're married to. You marry them and you love them, but the longer you're with them, the more you love them. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's the same way with the Lord. The more you're with Him, the more you study, the deeper you go in His Word. You never get to that point where you think, well, I got it now. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and that's the truth. Years old on this earth, there's always and hearing from somebody else's uh, point of view is always interesting. Yeah. Because you don't know what they think. You don't know what they It inspires you to look for yourself. Right. And, yeah. and the more you know, the more you love it. And the more you love it, the more you love it. And the more you want to know. Yeah, that's true. Well, the scriptures are layers deep. So they are. You can get the superficial layer. Get Milk, the story line, pablum people. You can peel yeah. back a layer and all of a sudden you're now on the next level. Yeah. And the next level, like you said, and that comes with maturity. It does. And the more you study, the more you realize there's deeper meanings behind yeah. this. Yeah. You keep finding, like, I think of Indiana Jones and his search for. Right, fill in the blank. Yeah, yeah. It's a perfect analogy. Food, food for thought. Because it inspires you to think about, and it opens a lot of discussion. We've had more discussion in this lesson than we have in many. And I think this is a template for those of you who are out watching by way of the internet. This is a template for all believers in your own communities and local areas to get together and do these kinds of things where you present the word and you discuss the word and you analyze it and think about it in the facets of the gym that you're looking at and how it. Um, I saw an illustration, and I'll close with this, this morning. I happened to be reading something, and it talked about a guy who was um, trying to find the, the understanding of something. And the guy said, it's like trying to understand the depth and the complexity of all the oceans in the world by looking at a single drop of water in the palm of your hand. And I thought, that's pretty close to the truth right there, because... You know, that little drop of water is just the beginning of the depth of what's going on. And think about what they're actually discovering in the oceans now, like the really what the Granita was talking about earlier, and that there are lakes within the ocean, fresh water within the oceans, pockets of that. All kinds of stuff that's going on, yeah. All kinds of stuff that they're learning. But, you know, we'll probably have criticism because we've talked a lot and we've shared a lot with each other during this. But this, but we're class, yeah, and we come here to learn. It's being broadcast for others to watch, right? But 
This is our class. This is our fellowship that we do. Yeah. No, and it's it's and I again think it's as the days unfold and the censorship that you can see around us, it's really accelerating. There will be in the very, very near future, we probably won't be able to broadcast this. We it's churches hard. will be closed. It is where there there will no not be an outlet for you as so we're hoping again that this is a template for you that you can go. We need to start something local. We need to start something in our communities, in our barns, caves, like first century believers. Um, it's important. It, it really is. And I hope this has been beneficial to you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we give thanks for this opportunity to present your truth in whatever imperfect way that I've done it today. Um, we want the truth of the Spirit, the sword of the Spirit, to reach out through the medium that we're presenting it and touch lives, cut out the bad stuff, encourage people to be Bereans, get into the Word, get into a fellowship that allows true and open discussion with what's going on around us and apply biblical truths and understanding to that. We ask the blessing of the Most High to fall upon all those who watch this and that have been here in our class physically. We want you to be filled with the truth and with the blessing that God promises to those who study his word and fervently seek his truth. And we ask it in the mighty, precious name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said. Amen.